Hello, I am Joe Crenshaw, and I thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak today about highly digestible protein feed ingredients for piglets. Over my 40 year career, I have worked uh, in academia, feed industry product development and consulting. And uh, for the past 20 years have been working with APC and our R&D group has been uh, heavily involved with uh, research associated with young animal nutrition and, and sow nutrition. When we think about one of the bigger problems in getting pigs started to eat is they go through a uh, post weaning growth depression. We wean pigs and they're fresh and healthy looking at weaning. We can do a great job of, of putting growth on these pigs and weaning them around that uh, 21 to 28 days of age. Uh, but uh, a few days after weaning, we see this uh, very commonly uh, in some pigs, uh, a failure to thrive a few days after weaning. And the effects of weaning stress can be multiple. Uh, and multiple factors that can affect it. And the result is it reduces feed intake and growth. That's why you're seeing these kind of pigs uh, showing up uh, a few days after weaning. Uh, you see increased diarrhea with these pigs. And it also induces inflammation, particularly in the intestinal system, uh, which can also induce intestinal damage. Uh, intestinal damage can also impact subsequent pig formants all the way to market. And if you look at uh, some older research, but uh, I think still very uh, appropriate for today's times as well. Uh, if pigs do not gain anything that first week post weaning, it takes them up to 10 more days to get to market weight. And this extra days to market will add more fixed costs per pig sold. And if you look at uh, some data from uh, Paredes et al in uh, 2012 uh, uh, from a genetic uh, evaluation of data from over 77,000 individual pigs, 70% of body weight at the end of the nursery was explained by birth weight, season of year, weaning weight, and body weight at six weeks, weeks of age, which is typically, you know, uh, two to three weeks post weaning. And 30% of the body weight at market was explained uh, by body weight at the end of the nursery. So it's very important that we really uh, focus in on developing nursery feeds that uh, enhance growth rate of those pigs, even up to six weeks of age, as well as body weight at the end of the nursery. post weaning uh, growth depression can have long-term effects. And I think this data helps point that out. Simply put, pigs that do not eat post weaning do not grow. Uh, so we use phase feeding to try to optimize production. And, that first feed in the nursery, we really need to focus on providing a very highly digestible and palatable, palatable feed and provide that feed for one to three weeks post weaning, depending on the stress load of, of the animals. And this helps support animal welfare and health. We do not like to see these uh, uh, failure to thrive pigs uh, in our nurseries. Uh, and as we are working towards uh, globally, towards trying to reduce reliance on medications and antimicrobials and diets, uh, this becomes even more important that we get uh, digestibility uh, figured out uh, so we can formulate diets to be highly digestible and put together the right combination of ingredients that make it palatable for pigs to take off eating and growing well. Uh, this will help also minimize nutrient waste and pollution, and it certainly makes the animal caretaker job much easier. I know in my younger years uh, working in 
in uh, production facilities, uh, uh, getting pigs started to eat uh, was very, very important. And uh, it, uh, if you got a good pigs off to a good start eating and growing, uh, it solved a lot of problems later on in life and also helped reduce the need for medications and antibiotics and individual medication treatments. So why use highly digestible protein sources during this post-weaning period? Uh, that pig is transitioning from sow milk to feed. Uh, the pigs, uh, the age we wean pigs today, even, uh, uh, you know, if we're weaning anywhere from 21 to 28 days of age, that digestive function still needs to adapt. Uh, we have intestinal inflammation occurring post wean up to two to three weeks post weaning and some information I'll show you later helps confirm that. Uh, and the, the pig's natural immune development is still underway. Pig's uh, immune system uh, typically does not uh, fully develop uh, until they're uh, beyond eight weeks of age. And at this weaning period in pigs, as we mix them and put them together into nursery facilities, they're gonna get exposed to other pathogens from other pigs. Uh, and they're just more or less resilient against pathogens and stress occurring in commercial production. And also uh, any undigested protein that uh, bypasses into the lower tract uh, uh, gets fermented and uh, undigested protein uh, certainly favors uh, uh, pathogenic microbial populations in the hindgut that can also contribute to poor health later on in life. And so uh, when we think about sources of protein ingredients, uh, certainly uh, most people around the world are using soybean meal uh, in all global regions. In some regions, uh, canola rapeseed meal is used to a little more extensively than other regions. Uh, and fish meal has been commonly used uh, throughout the world and in uh, starter diets. Uh, certainly milk, whey, and cheese byproducts uh, are used today. Uh, and uh, even blood and meat and bone meal-based uh, uh, products, uh, poultry byproduct meal and yeast proteins have traditionally been used uh, over the many years I've been involved with, with pig nutrition. Uh, and then there's certainly uh, specialty proteins such as spray dried plasma, colostrum and egg uh, based products that are, are designed to uh, particularly uh, uh, help encourage feed intake and help pigs transition through uh, some of the uh, post weaning growth lag that occurs in the earlier diets for the nursery. Um, and then uh, we also have available today a lot more uh, concentrated protein sources uh, such as from soy protein concentrates or isolates of proteins uh, that are highly more highly digestible than, than just your say traditional soybean meal. We also have available digest uh, type products and here I'm talking about uh, products that are either of animal or, or, or plant uh, origin that have been hydrolyzed uh, to variable molecular weight. So uh, this is very important to understand uh, the source of the digest or hydrolyzed product to understand uh, uh, how high a percentage of peptides and free amino acids are available uh, would probably dictate the digestibility, overall digestibility of that product. And uh, uh, depending on the area of the wor world uh, you're working in, uh, uh, these uh, are more or less available depending on, uh, again, where you're located. Uh, and then there's uh, more developing uh, areas, uh, specialty proteins involved uh, from uh, fermentation biomass of say amino acid production or, or other uh, fermentation processes that uh, produce microbial proteins that, that can be uh, 
very highly digestible. Uh, and you're also seeing more uh, discussions and work involved with uh, single cell proteins, uh, particularly algae or yeast-based proteins, or insect proteins, another new uh, fairly recent uh, development of uh, uh, products I think that will be coming uh, more available in the future uh, that can have some potential benefit in use in pig diets. And so if we think about uh, processing, say, of soy pro products, uh, the whole goal of, of soy products has been, uh, you know, to reduce the anti-nutritional factors uh, to improve overall digestibility. So if we start with soybeans, uh, you know, unless they're uh, processed to some temperature, you'll have anti-nutritional factors like trypsin inhibitor and uh, uh, oligosaccharides that, that uh, uh, can, can affect the overall digestibility of the diet. So I think the soy industry is, you know, developed over the years, uh, you know, solvent extracted or expelled soybean meal uh, type products. Uh, one, they're removing the oil uh, to use for food industry and, and in the animal feed industry, we're then utilizing these byproducts of the oil production from soybeans. Uh, and we progress to developing soy protein concentrates, uh, chemical or enzyme hydrolysis of, of the soy proteins, uh, fermentation of the soy proteins. Uh, we uh, now have available uh, soybeans that are uh, low a cigarette, uh, genetically selected to be uh, contain low amounts of oligosaccharides. And uh, we even go as far as isolating soy protein up to say 80% soy protein uh, as a soy protein isolate uh, ingredient that, that can be used. Uh, in uh, pig nutrition. Uh, however, a lot of these are, are focused primarily in human nutrition use today. And so when we think about precision nutrition, what are, we, what are our goals for pre, uh, precision nutrition? Uh, I think uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, Pomar and uh, Mildred and Remus over in the Netherlands, uh, uh, wrote a book uh, and, uh, uh, about poultry and pig nutrition and uh, really brought out the concept of precision nutrition uh, to help improve production efficiency. And our goal as a nutritionist is to uh, avoid over or under supplying nutrients relative to daily requirements. And this involves meeting the changing nutrient requirements of pigs over time while accounting for differences in individual pig requirements. And the need then is to synchronize the dietary energy supply uh, and protein supply to improve protein retention and overall protein utilization efficiency in both pigs and poultry. This requires a very accurate determination of the true nutritional value of a particular ingredient and the physiological responses uh, from that, uh, these various feed ingredients. And so when we talk about true nutritional physiological value, we need to think about putting a check or removing the detrimental components uh, in a particular ingredient, much like the soy industry has done in terms of trying to reduce, uh, you know, some of the anti-nutritional factors with various processing methods or genetic selection of, of soybeans. Uh, and then we also need to understand what are the functional components of particular ingredients, for example, like plasma, uh, colostrum, or, or egg products that that are known to have some functional components and we need to better understand the fu functional components of all ingredients as well, if there's some available there. And so when we start thinking even bit more deeply about precision nutrition, we really need to understand protein digestion kinetics. Uh, I think, uh, 
<clears throat> excuse me, when we think of protein digestion, uh, we think about secretion of digestive enzymes. What factors really affect that? Uh, enzymatic hydrolysis of these proteins has to occur. Uh, and then uh, transit of that digestion through the tract uh, is uh, sped up or slowed down, kind of depending on, uh, say, the amount of fat or the amount of fiber we may have in the diet of, and the types of fiber that may affect transit of digestion as well as disease uh, status and things like that that can certainly affect transit of digesta when we're thinking about pathogenic E. coli or things like that. Uh, and we also need to make sure we're understanding the absorption of peptides and amino acids. Uh, not only are they digested, but are they absorbed and uh, uh, are we getting that uptake into, into the uh, uh, blood of the animal. And then also we need to understand uh, better, you know, protein fermentation by microbiota, uh, undigested protein that, uh, uh, you know, passes into the lower gut uh, can certainly be uh, uh, a, a contributing factor to development of uh, pathogen uh, populations in the hindgut particularly. Uh, and then protein digestion kinetics are, are very important. We need to, again, synchronize that dietary supply of, of energy and protein so that we're making sure we've got available energy uh, as well as protein uptake occurring that consistently supports animal growth and production. Uh, this will help improve protein retention and utilization efficiency in both pigs and poultry. And of course, uh, better feed efficiency is desirable and uh, certainly contributes to less nutrient waste and pollution in our environment today. I think an interesting study by, by Dr. Chen at uh, 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 Wagenhagen University in uh, in the Netherlands uh, pointed out that uh, uh, there's different rates of uh, digestion or protein kinetics in terms of absorption of uh, plasma amino acid or, or, or amino acids and peptides into the, the plasma. And a, for example, in this study, we, we see that uh, uh, wheat gluten or uh, dried porcine plasma is uh, more uh, contributes to a more rapid uptake of plasma uh, amino acids and peptides relative to say products like soybean meal, rapeseed meal, or uh, black soldier fly in this case. Uh, and also at the end of the ileum, then we see there's less uh, uh, amino acids showing up over time. And so the implications are that uh, both wheat gluten and uh, uh, porcine plasma in this study were more rapidly digested in the small intestine with less than this digested protein being passed into the hind gut. And that is digestibility of these proteins, uh, you know, vary depending on the type of protein as well as the segment of the intestine uh, where they were being absorbed. Uh, throughout the small intestine. And I think uh, I would like to point out uh, this recent review in, in uh, uh, the journal Animals uh, by uh, the University of Minnesota team, uh, Jerry Sherson and uh, uh, co-workers and including uh, Pedro uh, uh, published this review uh, this year. Uh, and I encourage you to really look into the uh, details of this review. It's a very extensive review uh, talking about uh, measures matter in determining both the true nutrition, uh, physiological value of feed ingredients for swine. And I think it goes into a very good uh, history of what's progressed over the years in terms of going back from formulating diets based on crude protein to uh, amino acids, total amino acids to apparent ileal digestible amino acids to 
standardizing the digestible amino acids and uh, how uh, these different measures and understanding the true nutritional physiological value of a feed, looking both at detrimental as well as uh, functional components uh, in an ingredient is very important for improving overall efficiency and really points out to where our future is going in, in swine nutrition. When we think about uh, uh, methods uh, for determining digestibility of protein and amino acids, how does this relate to precision nutrition? Uh, and you, to get back to some basic terminology for digestibility, I think you know we all uh, lean on uh, publication from uh, uh, NRA in France or, or CBNA here in Brazil or, or uh, NRC in Swine or other resources uh, uh, to uh, come up with uh, digestibility values to better fine tune our diets to improve overall feed efficiency and production. And when we think about uh, apparent ileal digestibility, AID. What we're really talking about here is we're measuring the amino acid intake of a, a feed uh, or, or an ingredient uh, and subtracting out the amino acid outflow from the end of the ileum and then dividing that by amino acid intake times 100 to get a percent. Uh, however, this does not measure ileal endogenous amino acid loss, IAA end, uh, and AID values of individual feed ingredients are not additive uh, for formulation of mixed feeds. In other words, they, they tend to uh, not to add up for individual ingredients to what you would predict it to be in the feed. When we think about uh, true ileal amino acid digestibility, we're actually looking at amino acid intake minus uh, outflow of, through the ileum uh, and minus the total endogenous uh, 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 proteins or amino acids uh, uh, exiting the ileum. And then we divide that uh, by amino acid intake uh, to get 100%. Uh, total ileal endogenous amino acids are measured both basal uh, diet dependent endogenous loss and specific diet dependent endogenous loss. It's a very tedious uh, and specific uh, dependent on the protein source evaluated. And unfortunately, there are no routine standard procedures established for determining specific endogenous losses. Uh, each uh, study that's been done have been very specific based on the protein source they're evaluating. And so uh, standardized ileal amino acid digestibility has been developed as a way of looking at uh, amino acid intake minus ileal amino acid outflow minus the basal ileal amino acid ex, uh, uh, exiting the uh, ileum divided by amino acid intake times 100 to get your percent SID value. This uh, methodology will typically use a standard nitrogen-free diet to measure basal endogenous loss and a purified diet with the tested protein source. Uh, these individual ingredient SID values then are usually additive for formulation of mixed feed. And this has become the standard today uh, and most uh, 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 tables from uh, amino acid companies or uh, academia groups like NRC uh, or INRA uh, are uh, using and uh, reporting standardized ileal digestibility values for various uh, feed ingredients. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of ingredients out there that we may not have uh, information on or, or very much information on. Uh, 
uh, while others like soybean meal, you know, you have several, several uh, studies there looking at ingredients like that. Uh, however, if we start to think about some of the newer developing ingredients, uh, these values may be lacking. And, uh, uh, and another kind of shortfall of uh, standardized noodle digestibility is that it may actually underestimate the, the total endogenous loss. So we may not be getting exactly to the true amino acid digestible value, but we're getting pretty close on most ingredients. And I think, uh, you know, when we start again, thinking about other uh, newer proteins out there or, or products out there that maybe we don't have a good database on, uh, there are several uh, 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 methods people use today to predict uh, the, the protein or amino acid digestibility and ingredients. Uh, and I think this review uh, uh, by Eva Swick uh, in the Journal of Animal Science and Biology or Biotechnology uh, uh, does a great job of discussing uh, various in vitro methods uh, used to predict uh, protein uh, and energy evaluation. Uh, certainly uh, in vitro methods are, are much less expensive to do than in vivo studies, uh, uh, digestibility studies. Uh, and it also talks about uh, near infrared uh, spectrometry, uh, various prediction equations uh, using combinations of both AID or SID values. But again, they really uh, rely on the established in vitro digestibility values. Uh, and I think it's very important that we recognize and appreciate all the hard work of uh, academia and uh, uh, people that have done these in vivo digestibility studies uh, and uh, put forth the uh, effort and funding to, uh, to really uh, help design and provide that information to the industry. And so if we look at NRC swine uh, in 2012, just to talk a little bit more about the digestibility of say soybean based products or proteins uh, commonly used in nursery feeds, uh, you know, we have a whole list of, of several different uh, types of soybean products out there, including full fat soy meal, uh, various solvent or expelled or dehulled or non-dehulled, uh, uh, soybean meals, uh, ferment, fermented soybean meals, <clears throat> enzyme treated soy products, soy protein concentrates, and even soy protein isolate. And, and as you look at these various uh, uh, soy products, you know, your AID uh, very typically uh, and consistently, regardless of the concentration of protein and ingredient, uh, is less than the uh, uh, standard ileal digestible uh, crude protein uh, coefficients. And the same is true for, for the amino acids in general and, and lysine here is an example. And we look at uh, animal protein ingredients. Uh, uh, again, uh, we see a very similar type pattern. Uh, 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 we see uh, lower AID values for crude protein or lysine compared to uh, SID values uh, for the various uh, commonly used uh, uh, protein ingredients uh, in nursery feeds. Uh, and we need to also uh, understand the processing of various uh, ingredients, how it affects ileal digestibility estimates. And uh, spray dried products, for example, of animal blood or blood cells or plasma versus rendered products, uh, traditional rendered products, which use uh, a longer and higher duration of heat treatment uh, can uh, definitely impact the uh, uh, crude protein and uh, total amino acids as well as other amino acid coefficients relative to a rendered product. Uh, rendered products having lower 
uh, digestibility uh, overall compared to uh, spray dried products. And thermal uh, processing conditions can definitely affect uh, digestibility of, of the ingredient as you're uh, looking at uh, any kind of a ingredient to uh, look at the uh, 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 ask questions about how it's processed and whether it's subjected to a less damaging uh, process versus a more uh, heat damaging process that affects availability and digestibility of the proteins and amino acids in that product. Another factor that uh, we, we often uh, uh, don't have good data on is uh, how uh, age of an animal affects uh, digestibility of, of both the ingredient and the diet. And this can vary uh, for young versus older uh, chicks. For example, in uh, some recent studies uh, we collaborated with at the University of Illinois, uh, we were looking at amino acid digestibility of soybean meal versus uh, spray dried plasma in 10 and 21 day old chicks. And, and the digestibility uh, of soybean meal was much lower, uh, significantly lower for a 10 day old chick versus a 21 day old chick, whereas plasma was not significantly different in digestibility for a 10 day old or 21 day old chick. So when we put uh, 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 plasma in the feed for a seven day old chick, uh, uh, feeding plasma at 2% of the diet, uh, we do see improvements in dry matter, organic matter and crude protein uh, for chicks fed plasma compared to a control diet without plasma. And again, this indicates uh, that uh, digestibility estimates uh, need to be refined for, for young versus older animals. And I think a lot of the values that you see in say uh, some of the tables for NRC uh, uh, for uh, standardized ileal digestible values were based on growing pigs, not on younger pigs. And when we look at uh, a recent review of 135 publications comparing uh, plasma versus other proteins uh, in diets for, for nursery pigs, uh, we see that uh, the uh, plasma, uh, pigs fed plasma versus other proteins consistently supported higher incremental improvements in both feed intake and growth uh, even through 40 days post weaning, even though pigs may have only been fed plasma in the diet in a lot of these studies just in the first one or two or maybe three weeks uh, post weaning. So again, uh, indicating that in younger stage animals, uh, we may not have a very good uh, clear picture of what uh, uh, predicted versus measured uh, 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 ileal digestibility of crude protein and amino acids are, are really appropriate for uh, younger animals. And so when we think of standardized ileal digestible crude protein and amino acids of an ingredient, uh, the sum of those ingre uh, values uh, in the individual ingredient should equal the uh, predicted amount of SID amino acid formulated for the, the complete mixed diet. And so if predicted equals measured, then uh, the SID amino acid of the uh, estimates of the ingredients are additive and should equal that amount in the mixed diet. However, if uh, predicted does not equal measured, uh, uh, then standard ileal digestible amino acid uh, uh, values for ingredients are not additive in a mixed diet. And uh, we do know, you know, depending on the make makeup of the diet, that uh, 
for example, added fat can increase the SID amino acid digestibility of mixed diets. And uh, in that case, uh, it, uh, when we add uh, extra fat in the diets, the SID amino acids uh, may not be additive in the formulation. And we may actually underestimate the actual value of that uh, ingredient in that diet. Uh, and so we know uh, uh, feeding plasma protein uh, has a profound impact on uh, uh, gut health of the animal, gut function, and uh, some research uh, we worked with uh, uh, a few years ago uh, showed that uh, when we fed diets uh, containing zero, two and a half or 5% plasma uh, for two weeks post weaning, uh, pigs fed 5% plasma had less diarrhea, uh, also uh, less uh, inflammation occurring in the uh, intestinal tissue, uh, a reduction in TNF alpha uh, in the intestinal tissue if they were fed 5% plasma, and even up through 14 days post weaning, we were still uh, seeing intestinal inflammation occurring in these animals. But uh, pigs fed 5% plasma had a reduced uh, inflammation occurring in that intestine. When we looked at barrier function, uh, we also saw that there was less gut leakage occurring in uh, pigs fed 5% uh, plasma uh, uh, both at seven and 14 days post weaning. And so we would recommend uh, a minimum of 5% plasma for 14 days post weaning uh, to help improve gut function. So this then brings the question, can plasma and feed actually increase the SID of crude protein and amino acids originating from other ingredients? in diets for young pigs. Uh, so in uh, uh, some research that we've been funding at the University of Illinois, uh, working with uh, uh, Hannah Bailey and Hans Stein at University of Illinois, we, we set up and uh, tried to answer this question, uh, you know, can plasma increase the SID of protein and amino acids uh, from other ingredients in diets for young pigs, and actually focus in on uh, looking at uh, different types of diets and how that affects uh, both predicted and measured uh, 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 SID values uh, in ingredients. And so we set up uh, four uh, kind of regional diets, uh, diets that would be more typical of, say, the United States uh, and, and, and Brazil as well, uh, corn, soybean meal, soy protein concentrate as your major grain and protein source uh, versus uh, uh, a European uh, type diet uh, with corn, wheat, barley, soybean meal, and soy protein concentrate, or maybe a, a more upper North uh, Canadian uh, uh, or Russian type diet that might uh, uh, utilize small grains only, such as wheat and barley, uh, soybean meal, and uh, fermented soybean meal. Our diet's more typical of Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, rice, corn, soybean meal, fermented soy, and fish meal. <coughs> and then we took these regional diets and uh, uh, either fed the regional, 100% of the regional diet, or uh, a diet with 6% added plasma plus 94% of the regional diet. Uh, there were 30 uh, castrated males uh, uh, in your, uh, uh, cannulated, uh, the ileum was cannulated at 35 days of age. Again, we wanted to, to do studies focused on uh, where we're typically using products like plasma. And these pigs were an average of about nine kilogram body weight at the start. And we used a 10 by three Uden square design with five day adaptation of, to the diet with two day uh, collection uh, for determining uh, ileal digestibility values. 
sorry. And so when we measured uh, SID crude protein, uh, uh, comparing zero versus 6% spray dried plasma diets by various regions, uh, we saw a uh, uh, improvement in uh, uh, what we saw was a uh, plasma by region uh, both uh, affected the, the main effects of plasma or region uh, had a significant effect on the measured uh, crude protein, uh, as well as uh, there was a significant interaction, particularly with uh, uh, the Canadian diets. Again, the wheat barley based diets, uh, we saw a much higher uh, SID crude protein uh, value uh, for the diet containing plasma. When we look at uh, SID lysine, uh, the interaction was not significant. So we had a main effect of uh, plasma as well as region uh, on these diets. And uh, lysine is a, is, was a little uh, different in that it improved uh, consistently across uh, all regions when plasma was included in the diet. When we look at SID methionine, and we again saw this interaction uh, between uh, uh, plasma and region in the diet. And uh, again, the uh, Canadian diet uh, uh, particularly uh, saw a large improvement in SID methionine. Uh, the same pattern was observed for threonine, uh, tryptophan, and uh, the other amino acids we looked in these add in these diets. Uh, so if we look at the variance of measured minus predicted uh, 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 SID values uh, for the diets containing plasma, uh, we see uh, really no difference uh, in uh, US diets uh, uh, between the measured and predicted values. Uh, we saw a slight improvement on uh, uh, lysine for the European diets, uh, but again, all amino acids, including protein, were uh, had a significantly higher variance uh, uh, measured over predicted uh, SID, and uh, really had no difference was uh, seen in the Asian diets. So, uh, in summary, in conclusions on on this particular study, we're seeing that measured versus predicted. SID amino acid values in diets without pl with plasma uh, uh, were mostly additive in diets for US, Europe, and Asia based ingredients. Uh, but in Canadian uh, based ingredients, wheat with high amounts of wheat and barley. Uh, uh, we saw a significantly increased SID of crude protein and the amino acids. Uh, and so the predicted uh, crude protein and amino acids were not additive in these Canadian diets. So this means that uh, we need to better understand how different ingredients and uh, different mixtures of ingredients in diets uh, can affect uh, our estimates for uh, standardized ileal digestibility uh, measures and values, and that uh, there may be more value uh, uh, associated with feeding plasma than maybe what we understand uh, in terms of formulation purposes. Uh, we may be able to capture more value out of plasma uh, in our formulations and uh, adjust our, our, our values. Uh, so, uh, this does suggest there's better digestive function associated with feeding plasma in these, uh, particularly in these uh, Canadian-based diets. And so uh, we continue to have more work uh, in, uh, ongoing in this area. We are looking at uh, also the impact of plasma on energy, calcium, phosphorus, and uh, digestibility in these uh, similar mixed diets by region and that information is a forthcoming. Uh, so as concluding comments, uh, highly digestible feed ingredients are important to help overcome weaning stress. And that has both short-term and long-term 
economic benefits in, in pig production. I think it's, uh, again, I can't overemphasize how important it is to get pigs uh, started eating and growing, especially that first to second week post weaning uh, to uh, uh, minimize uh, uh, that growth lag and uh, uh, capture the real value uh, out of these highly digestible uh, feeds we're trying to put together for pigs to overcome this. Uh, an accurate uh, determination of SED values for ingredients, particularly by age of animal, uh, uh, and especially when we're talking about uh, young animal nutrition, we really need to understand that better. And this can really help improve our precision nutrition formulations and that should help us lead to more efficient production and utilization of nutrients. And uh, we again need to better understand both the detrimental and functional components in various feed ingredients. Uh, and I think this work continues to develop. And um, I again uh, iterate, uh, it'd be good to review uh, uh, the paper from the University of Minnesota group. Uh, and measures do matter. Uh, I think uh, I like the way they, they uh, stated that in, in their paper. I think it's uh, very important. Uh, we can uh, gain more value out of our diets uh, in our formulations if we uh, pay due diligence to determine uh, as accurate as possibly the, uh, SA, the amino acid values for ingredients and how do we then synchronize that with energy utilization as well uh, to, to improve overall uh, production uh, uh, diet uh, and uh, feed efficiency. With that, I thank you and I uh, will be happy to answer your questions.